Good morning and welcome. Well, uh, today we're continuing in our look at the Sermon on the Mount, and most particularly, we're uh, talking about the, pr the life of prayer of the Christian. And we've made a lot of points, we've covered a lot of details about prayer, that it's supposed to be something that is uh, between you and God. Uh, doesn't mean that you always have to pray in a closet, but it does mean that you always keep clear in your mind that the focus of prayer is to connect with God, uh, and really in a sense to connect with His eternal being. And there is that dynamic that when we're truly in a, in a uh, prayer-like relationship with God, whether it's reading the Word or driving our car, or it's on a knee or laying in bed looking up at the sky, the reality is that we have the opportunity to really enter into that eternal dimension, a dimension where God dwells and, and have this one-on-one, -on -one, heart to heart personal conversation with God. Uh, but there are a lot of things that get in the way that when we're self-conscious about what other people are thinking when we pray, especially in a public setting, or when we think that we can impress God by how long we pray or how earnestly we pray or how many words we say or how eloquent our prayer is, all of those things are, are useless and, and really just take us off message and, and lead us to really a dead end where we wonder, why doesn't God hear my prayer? Uh, like the prophet said, I feel like heaven is brass over my head. Well, that's how you begin to feel when you approach God in that way. And it's also, I think, as I talked about yesterday, the biggest obstacle to effective prayer is the fact that I want what I want, and I'm not really open to what God wants. Again, I reminded my favorite quote from C.S. Lewis that prayer doesn't change God, it changes me. And I think that um, when we understand that really the idea of praying is to bring my life into alignment with his heart and his will, then I know where the joy comes. When Then I begin to find that it's seeking to build his kingdom by adding souls. And as we've talked about before, it's not a geographical kingdom. It's a kingdom that is, is a, a multi-dimensional, if you will. It's not limited to the material world as we know it with its limited dimensions. It's, it's eternal and it permeates everything. And so when we reach out to God, we come into that, that divine presence and his eternal being and we have fellowship with him. As I said before, the whole uh, basically structure of prayer is that I pray to the Father in the name of the Son by, by the authority that I have in Christ uh, through the power of the Holy Spirit. So when I ask Christ into my heart, I gained the authority of Sonship that I can talk to the Father. And as a consequence, the Holy Spirit, which is also called the Spirit of Christ, he takes the prayers of my heart and communicates them to God and creates a communion in words that can't even be uttered. There's, I believe that there's, there's a heavenly language that you and I cannot know or understand, but when we pray, the Holy Spirit is our translator, and he actually, you know, it's like one time I was in Russia, and I asked somebody after the message, I said, did the translator translate my message well or correctly, and, and the individual said back to me, no, it was what much improved, and so I thought, sometimes I think that's the way prayer is. It's, it's God takes my prayer, and he improves it, uh, through the Holy Spirit's uh, translation of it into the presence of God. Which brings me uh, to the next point where he says, and this is where it starts getting into the more practical day-to-day -day needs, where he says, give us this day our daily bread. This is the idea, and I think it's con contained in the whole thing, is not just food, but the idea that God understands, as he says later on in the sermon in chapter 6, that he knows what we have need of before we ever ask him for our need. And if he takes care of the birds of the air and the flowers of the field, he's certainly going to take care of us. But it's that idea that... Um, I recognize that he is the provider. And it's not that I'm praying because I don't think he'll provide, but it's rather I'm praying because I know it comes from his hand. That man does not live by bread alone, we're told, but he lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. But part of that living is have food to eat and shelter and clothing and transportation and all those basic needs that part of our modern world. And when we pray, we're recognizing, acknowledging in a, in a heart of thankfulness uh, that God Give to me the day, the things that I need for today. But it also implies that I'm not looking past today. And, and that's why my father-in-law used to always say, don't borrow tomorrow's problems, he says, because you have enough of them today. And so when we pray, we, we're trusting God that even though we don't know what tomorrow's going to bring, and believe me, you and I don't, that we know that God's got it all under control and he's gone before us and he's made the way for us and prepared for us. You know, it, it's kind of like, a, I, I think about some of these long range distance or people who do the Iditarod and how there are places set up all along the journey for them to stop and, and rest and refresh. And it's kind of like that with us and God, that he has gone before us and he's paved the way and he's prepared for the needs that we have when we get there 
because he understands it's impossible for us to fully grasp what we need. Now, does that mean that we do no organizing or planning? I, I hope you don't draw that conclusion because, you know, as um, uh, D.L. Moody once said about his revival meetings, he said that I, I prepare like there's no God and then I pray like there's no preparation. Uh, I think that's the balance. We are supposed to be earnest and responsible and do the best we can. But in the end, after we've done all that we can do, we need to commit it to God because he's the only one that can breathe life into it. It's like a farmer, you know, you plow the field, you fertilize it, you, you do everything, you get, get it ready, and then you put the seed in. But once you put the seed in, you can water it, but you can't make it grow. Only God can make it grow in the same way as our service to God. We can't make anything grow. So whether you're starting a business or you're starting a ministry, uh, it's always the same concept. It, there's always going to be hard work involved, but it's really knowing at the end of the hard work that unless God breathes life upon it, it will never become anything substantial or significant. And so it's God who is the giver. And then one more last point, and I'll wrap up with this, is that it also implies thankfulness. That I'm thankful when I receive from God. And one of the things he says in Romans 1 that men who turned away from God is that they, even though they knew God, they were not thankful, nor did they give God glory. And that's why I tell people, you should pray before you sit down and eat your meal, whether you're alone or whether you're the family or friends, because it's always that, you know, three times a day at the very least, you have the opportunity to remind yourself that what I have in front of me right now is from the hand of God and everything else is from the hand of God, whether it become provisions or safety, or even a pleasurable time. <laughs> like my, my son and his family are down at uh, Disney, uh, Disney World right now. And I mean, you know, they're having a great time, I'm sure. The pictures seem to indicate that. And that's a blessing of God. That's a provision of God. So we need to always, you know, stop and thank God for, for the good things that he gives us, including the people, the opportunities, and everything else. Oh, well, I'm over my time, so I'll stop here. But uh, look forward uh, to getting together again with you tomorrow.